Welcome back. Climate Refugees, a nonprofit organization established in November 2015, aims to raise awareness and provide aid to people who have been displaced due to climate change. Using the term climate gentrification, the organization highlights how underserved and vulnerable communities face unique challenges in regard to climate change. Joining me to discuss climate gentrification is the founder of Climate Refugees, Amali Tower. Amali, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Now, can you just tell me a little bit more about your organization, Climate Refugees? Sure. Well, as you as you rightly said, it was founded in November 2015 uh, by me. Um, I come from a refugee protection background. So, you know, I, I had been interviewing refugees and forcibly displaced people for a long time, well over a decade by then, um, all around the world. And it was incredible to hear refugees describe climate change as one of the many drivers that had forced them across their country and to seek refuge in another. And then also to hear them talk about climate change as a factor that prevented them from being able to go back. You know, things like return to what? Because our crops have failed and there's a drought. Um, at that point, the light sort of went on in my head, you know, and, and it's, it's just incredible to learn from people who are, you know, have that lived experience. And that led to the founding of the organization. And we work to promote the rights and protections of people displaced across um, borders or even within their country due to climate change. Now, I'm so happy that light went off uh, because I think that, uh, you know, it, it really gave way to, to allow so many people to learn about something that's happening. And unfortunately, like, we don't really talk about it, at least on a larger scale. When discussing climate change, we often focus on the environmental effects, which is, of course, very important. But can you just talk about how it's affecting communities of people um, you kind of talked about it a little bit. Can you expand on that? Sure, of course. I mean, for example, uh, it's one of the things that I noticed as well. You know, I'm not a climate scientist, right? I'm a humanitarian working with refugees. And when the light did go on for me, it was very apparent. The second light was, where are the people? The conversation is highly environmental. You know, it's about the climate science, all of which is incredibly important and, and valid and right. But it didn't focus the, the problem and the attention on how is this impacting human beings? their lives? How is this sort of setting us all back in terms of progress, development, human rights? Um, and, and that's really the lens through which we need to look at this. You know, how, how does climate change um, affect someone's um, health? Their, their, their right to seek education, um, their livelihoods. And it's really important that we respond to those impacts in time and scale because they tend to underpin displacement. And climate effects aren't just disasters like hurricanes and floods. It also leads to situations in which um, people are dealing with slow incremental effects of climate change, like extreme heat and drought, um, rising seas. So this is really how we need to look at it from a human, from a human standpoint. Now, what is climate gentrification? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a term that I ran across as well, you know, after I founded the organization. And I think Largely speaking, it refers to the fact of um, scientists kind of coming upon, social scientists, that the, ha the cost of housing was going up in areas that had experienced a climate disaster. So, for example, you know, I think we need to look at it as, as sort of two independent issues. There's climate change and then there's the forces that drive gentrification. Um, and, and then you also have to look at, look at it as an intersecting issue. Why are climate vulnerable communities um, facing higher levels of gentrification? Why is housing so much more expensive after a disaster? Why can populations not recover as easily from um, those disasters because of their underlying poverty? Now, you were recently in Miami where you got to explore this and how it's affecting the area. Can you tell me a little bit more about this experience? Yes, sure. So I went in Miami last month um, where I did some visits in particular neighborhoods and also interviewed populations that are sort of affected by some of the gentrification and climate gentrification ongoing. And these neighborhoods are Little Haiti and Liberty City, which happen to be in higher elevation zones, which is historically very marginalized. Uh, primarily due to redlining policies from the 1960s. Um, Miami's also Liberty City, for example, um, is a neighborhood and an enclave that came about 
after segregation. So there are a lot of underlying poverty, uh, marginalization, right, racism, segregation, land usage issues which are at play in these cities. And if you contrast the, the neglect happening in Little Haiti and Liberty City against the boom in development happening in Miami's downtown, you see a really stark contrast in one area being developed and gentrified and another being incredibly neglected. However, those neglected areas are now incredibly desirable to developers and to people living in coastal zones that are experiencing rising seas. So we've seen a situation in which the cost of housing is really going up in these neglected um, zones that are, as I said, at higher elevations. And this is coupled and happening at the same time when Miami is dealing with an incredibly um, stark housing issue. Uh, the cost of housing is absolutely unaffordable. There's a lack of affordable housing. Um, and also there's an increase in insurance costs that are skyrocketing. And it's not just for homeowners because even tenants, right? Those are sort of hidden costs that get passed on. Um, and utilities are incredibly, um, at somewhere between two and 500 is an average for even a two person, three person home to pay. So it's just simply unaffordable to actually exist in Miami. And now people are getting pushed out and in, in this gentrification to where they literally cannot afford to live in communities that they created. You know, Little Haiti is built by Haitian immigrants, Haitian refugees, and um, very, very few Haitians are even left there. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that experience. Now, I wanna talk about what's currently happening in Maui. Um, as we, we've seen, you know, the stories in the news, how is this an example of climate gentrification or how is it um, affected by climate gentrification? Yeah, I think similar to Miami, you're seeing the same issues sort of converging. So even before the fires, um, Maui was experiencing a major housing crisis, primarily that the cost of housing was unaffordable. And it, and it led to apparently native populations even leaving who couldn't afford to live in Maui. So that coupled with now the fires that have absolutely devastated the area does make it sort of prime real estate for developers, for people with opportunities that they want to strike in tourism or in new developments um, that can really find can afford to rebuild, can afford not just the cost of rebuilding in a very incredibly uh, expensive, in fact, the highest uh, housing market, but also can withstand the risks of further um, climate damages, not just fires, but more climate effects. So, and that's really the lens through which you have to look at it. How are people who are already sort of marginalized that are at in low income, uh, immigrant communities, people of color, who don't have the means to withstand a climate impact, also then don't have the means to rebuild and rehabilitate after a climate impact. And although there might be FEMA funds, state funds, city funds, those aren't necessarily available immediately. There might even be situations where people are building back on reimbursable bases. But how do you do that when you don't have the capital to put the money forth, right, even on that basis. So that's how you can really see how marginalized populations are at further risk to displacement as a result of climate effects. Now, I want to expand on that because whenever we see these things happen, we see so many relief funds uh, that come out. Can you just talk about, you know, are those, I mean, of course they're helpful, but how helpful are they? And what more is needed to ensure that these communities recover from displacement? Yeah, relief funds are incredibly important. They're life-saving, right? And they're life-saving in the crisis as it's happening, or even in slight post-recovery phase. But relief funds are not what we need to address what actually this problem is. This is an issue of climate justice or injustice, as I've sort of explained, right? And to really address the root cause of why these things happened, why climate effects are disproportionately disastrous for marginalized populations, you really have to address that as a justice issue. Um, and we do have the language in place and even the infrastructure in place to create what's called a loss and damage fund. And this comes out of our global architecture on climate change that comes out of the UN uh, framework convention on climate change. This is a fund that was established and agreed or rather agreed to establish last year, but it hasn't been funded. And it's a global fund and it's exactly the kind of money and response mechanism that we need to help communities rebuild when they've been devastated 
like a fire in Maui, right? I mean, we already know that the insurance costs in Maui are like 3.2 billion. In Florida, four insurance, national insurance carriers have pulled out of the state. Six went insolvent in Florida just last year. So even the private sector and the insurance markets can't withstand the risks. What makes us think that the average citizen who already has you know, difficulty getting through the daily cost of living has the means to um, you know, re rehabilitate after a climate disaster? So we do need a whole new um, era of, of climate finance to, to meet the needs of these rising disasters and its costs. Now, I also think this is just very important to know, you know, what role do our local and national government play in this? Yeah, absolutely. We need legislation, both at the national, local, um, you know, municipal ordinances, and then also internationally. And, you know, I've spoken a bit here about what the UN can do, right, internationally. But it, it really, I mean, laws become laws when, when countries enact them, right, in all their sort of different strata of legislation. And we need to be working um, in coordination, in cooperation, at all of those levels, you know, international, national, and at the city and state levels. Um, and there's that, that's exactly also commensurate with the type of response that's required. When a city, you know, like our own here in New York City or Miami, when residents are going through things that are really communal, um, we can't necessarily wait and, and also expect that the federal government understands the intricacies and the nuances. So it takes planning, preparedness, and recovery at all of those levels. Now, how does your organization use research to enact this type of change? Sure. Well, one of the things that I noticed right away was, as I said, the, the lack of sort of human beings in the conversation. And it became very clear to me that storytelling and narrative change are integral to the change that we actually need, the systemic change we need, right? Um, if we don't advance how these things are impacting people, you know, and also if we only respond to people's needs once there's been a disaster and they've been displaced, we've already missed opportunities along the way that could have been um, researched, documented and disseminated so that people can see these communities are actually, you know, suffering losses already. And they seem to be also climate driven. And that is an opportunity, a missed opportunity in which we could have actually responded, met the gap so that people aren't being left behind because of the climate crisis. Well, Molly, I want to thank you so much for joining us and honestly teaching me so much today, because as I mentioned before, like this was something that I wasn't very familiar with. Whenever we talk about climate change, it's always or usually environmental. Um, so it was so nice to kind of put that human aspect to it. So thank you again for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for bringing this issue to light. If you would like to learn more about Amali and her team's efforts, please go to their website at www.climate-refugees.org or you could follow them on social media at climate underscore refugees. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you miss any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum Channel 67 and Verizon Files Channel 33 or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. You can catch a brand new episode of Open with Darren Jaime on Wednesday and with Lena Valentin on Friday. I'm Kevin Aline, wishing you and your safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.